Welcome to the Peter Nerd Corporation, home of the MCE Max. I'd like to thank you for joining us as we continue along in our presentation series. Once again, we have Noah Bethel, the Vice President of Product Development. Hello from sunny Tampa, Florida. And Noah, this is a this is not the there are case studies in these these presentations that we're going to be putting together, but this is one part one of a three part series um, where we're going to look at what makes a successful motor maintenance program. Right, focus on the program rather than this, a specific uh, asset. And we have roughly we've been in business now for over a quarter of a century or twenty twenty six years, and a lot of us have been with the company for that amount of time. I know you have. I've been with it uh, for over 20 years, so we're getting a lot of gray hairs. Prior to that, we were ex-military uh, as well, so we have a maintenance background from that. So uh, we've seen a lot over our time. We have indeed. And so we're going to d dive deeper into what is a good program, and, and trifecta comes up. Yeah, I like to use the trifecta, the horse race, as a, as a, or horse racing, as an analogy compared to the maintenance program. And so if, if anyone's ever been involved in horse racing or, or betting on horse races, the trifecta is sort of like the big win, right? If you can pick the first, second, and third finishers for a horse race, it's called the trifecta, and there's big money, a big win at the end of that. Well, I try to use that as an analogy to maintenance program and say if you can pick the top three you know, processes that make a maintenance program work and you can apply all, to all those three, then you're going to win in the maintenance. Right. And, and if you pick one, of course you win. And if you pick two, you also win. Correct. But when you get all three, when you get all three elements of your reliability program working in unison, that is where you really get the biggest bang for your buck. Absolutely. So we come up, we have come up with this type of, of uh, our our first kind of key is quality control. Explain quality control to us, Noah. Right. So quality control is that I like to think the beginning of life, right? And it could be a the re life. You could be after a repair, or refurbishment, or a brand new motor. But the bottom line is, if you don't get started right, you are expecting a reduced life expectancy of the motor. And so we like to get right out front, get a quality control test, make sure we're getting what we paid for, and that everything is, is starting out just right. And this doesn't necessarily mean that it's from the original equipment manufacturer, right? So it doesn't have to be from the motor manufacturer. It could be, what if it went to a repair facility to get repaired? We're going to want to check that as well, right? Absolutely. And I wouldn't even differentiate too many of the tests that you perform from a brand new versus a refurbished motor. So absolutely, coming out of a repair, we want to apply the same test, the same approach to making sure that we're getting quality work and a quality asset. And if it's sitting in your warehouse and it's been there for a while, you're also going to want to test it there. So so what we mean by this is quality control is not just a one-time test, right? Maybe after it's been installed in the motor circuit, we want to test that as well. Right. And from cradle to grave, if you talk about the quality control level, you know, getting started is not just a healthy motor. It's a healthy power circuit. It's a healthy elect, you know, voltage and current coming to the motor. The power quality needs to be tested. All these things that come together you know, to, to say, hey, I'm going to push the start button and feel good about pushing the start button. So today, on our first part of our three-part series, we're just going to really focus on quality control. And so we come to a case study that really highlights quality assurance or quality control. And here it is, Noah, our first test. This was an actual motor that was at a repair facility that was going to be shipped to the end user after it had been uh, either rewound or something of that nature. It's a large motor. It's a very large motor, very likely a very critical motor, so expensive uh, to replace, expensive to fix. And you see on the data here that uh, on January 4th we take a test, it's 22% resistive imbalance. In red, so a resistive imbalance of that level is, is extremely high, and ha something has to be done about it. 22%, what we're doing is we're sending a DC signal into the three phases. We're trying to make sure that conductivity through these three phases is balanced, and if not, then we're worried about a high resistance connection, a shorted turn, something of that nature in the stator windings itself. So good job to the repair facility because said this motor, they said this motor cannot go out to the customer as is. We need to find out why it has this high resistive imbalance. They come back the next day. There's some changes in our in our uh, standard tests. We see maybe they remove the rotor, lower resistive imbalance, but still. 
Yeah, good catch. The 44 in millihenries of inductance down from 126 is exactly right. I suspect that they have yanked the rotor out, removed a lot of the iron that raises the inductance value. And so the, the other thing to note is the temperature went from 22 to 48. So they likely ran it through the heater again, hoping to maybe burn off some moisture or something to make a difference in that resistive imbalance. Um, and 7%, and much better than 22, but way higher than acceptable. Now, one of the... the the unique things about our standard test is we time date stamp that, and I'm always curious about that. I always want to look to see what time of day was this motor tested? What part of the year was it tested? Was it in the winter? Was it in the summer? Was it raining that day? Those are things that really can affect your data. But I also look at the date, and in this case here, it was right around the, the first of the year. What happens around that time frame? There's a lot of stuff going on, a little bit of a holiday celebration, some Christmas presents, some maybe uh, New Year's resolutions. I can guarantee you not 100% focus is placed on maybe the work at hand, and there's other things that creep into the mind. It's not malicious. We always say there's it, people make mistakes. It can happen. Um, and in this case here, we started to do a little bit more research, a little more troubleshooting, and we found what the culprit was. Right, so great picture. In this situation, you can see one of the you know joints on the stator windings connecting phases together or coils together within the slots um, is not soldered at all. That should be you know a soldered connection. It should be completely conductive. And what's interesting is the is is you know the the fact that they were able to find this. They likely ran current through, looked at thermal imaging from the motor shop level, and identified a cold spot at that point where the current wasn't conducting. So that gave us that high resistance connection that they saw. They This is a quick fix, right? Oh, yeah. All they got to do in this situation is basically solder it, uh, test it for continuity, put another, you know, insulate it again and be good to go. So that was just a quick quality control case study to highlight what, what the importance of quality control is. And remember, it doesn't just stop with testing the motor before you accept it. There's a lot of procedure involved or a lot of process places where you can do quality control. As always, we thank you for your time, and as a reminder, this is part one of a three-part series where we focused on quality assurance or quality control. Stay tuned for part two and part three, which will be coming up very shortly.